also on Bet. Um, you can also find me on Twitter uh, as Bet Hux if you are interested in following along with my research. Today, I will be talking about the use of 3D models in the classes classroom to increase access and equity to disadvantaged groups and students. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and share my PowerPoint presentation now. Um, I can just, okay, well, host disabled participant screen sharing. So um, I guess I maybe won't share my screen. Let me see if I can fix it, Beth, just one second, sorry. Okay, sorry about that, y'all. Justin, you're going to share, sorry, just give me a second here. Okay. Can you? Okay. Looks good. So, perfect. Sorry, just bear with me a second here. Okay, so today I will be talking about 3D models and their use in the classes classroom to increase equity and access. Um, and to also improve and enrich the, ex the student experience as well as your own. For the purpose of this talk, I am focusing on using previously existing 3D models that can be found online in the classroom and for students at home, on printing 3D objects from those models uh, for students and others to handle, and on having students create their own digital 3D models uh, for assignments. Oh, sorry. Um, so did, what do I mean by ancient 3D models? I mean, I'm discussing digital reproductions of real existing or previously existing ancient things and places. Um, I am also talking about still and live images or sites that can be interacted with and manipulated to view them from different perspectives and multiple angles. I am talking about 3D printed models of sites and these objects reproductions that can be handled and manipulated much the same way as the digital models can be. So here you can see uh, an image of a 3D model of the Pantheon. You can purchase a model like this off a website for $2 and uh, share it to your students who can then alter things like texture, color, um, you can uh, change the way the Pantheon looks over time so they can see it compressed into a few seconds, what would have been several hundred years of history. Uh, just general things like that. Um, you can do walkthroughs where you can walk into the building and look at the light through, um, through that famous sun, sunroof. So what can 3D models teach? Specifically for classics, um, 3D models are particularly useful for discussing assemblages in context. Um, you can discuss how things would have appeared in the ancient world in the spaces they would have occupied, which is really useful, especially for students who are used to seeing um, museum images of objects. Um, you can talk about how to place a statue. If you're looking at an, a 3D image of a statue and you see that the back isn't finished or that there's bolt holes, etc., you can know that it's meant to be maybe on a cornice. It's not meant to be viewed in... Um, in the round, et cetera. So students can get a better sense of how artists and architects work together to display these, these works. You can get a sense of scale and environment, um, reproducing things such as uh, palm trees, uh, different kinds of shrubbery. Um, and then of course, getting a sense of scale for students who only see objects on computers or printed in textbooks. The difference between uh, the statue of the Nile fountain that's in Rome versus an obelisk versus a clay lamp may not be that distinguishable if all a student sees are images on a website. Nuance about changes over time, I talked a little bit about on the previous slide, um, but it helps to prevent this sort of collapse of history from thousands of years into a single moment of a single building. And it also helps to discuss how different buildings uh, and different cityscapes would have looked at different periods of time in, in comparison to each other. 
Um, you can emphasize color or materiality. Uh, you can talk about the source of the materials used to make and build these things. Uh, and you can bring the ancient world to life. These are highly interconnected societies whose members had very complex inner lives, just like we do, and who loved beautiful things and needed useful things and lived and worked in and out of doors around all of the same architecture and objects that we're studying today, although they may have looked different in terms of coloration, et cetera. Um, but it helps, to, it helps students to think of these people as, pe as individuals with agency rather than sort of faceless masses. Um, beyond classics, 3D models are really useful to help show STEM-oriented parents and students that classics can teach useful practical skills as well, um, just as well as STEM courses can. Uh, my parents in particular, I used to study biochemistry and I switched to ancient history and they were not thrilled uh, because they couldn't really see how classics and ancient history would be applicable, how I could get a job, what use it would serve me in my future life. Um, now I do my best to show other people that classics is useful in any field you want to go into. Um, but, you know, it, for, for students and parents who are particularly focused on STEM issues, 3D modeling and, and database work can be a really useful draw there. Um, it teaches the value and relevance of ancient history to the modern world. And we have things to offer that can be used um, and viewed, especially in public facing history. Um, that, that classics is not particularly well known for its outreach um, among the general public, and this is a really good way to get people involved. It's wonderful for visual and tactile projects for different kinds of learners, um, people who may be, let's say, dyslexic, uh, who struggle to write long-term papers, um, or who have ADHD or other different kinds of learning differences, can, uh, often really excel when they're able to touch objects and relate those objects to ideas. Uh, the physical memory becomes attached to the literal memory and uh, it becomes more uh, retrievable in that way. Um, you can also teach students how to excavate the archive when they are making 3D models based out of plans that they have to read. So you can teach them how to read architectural plans and then demonstrate what those plans would have looked like in the ancient world in a full building. It makes it not so abstract. Um, there are also lar larger opportunities for pre-doctoral uh, pre publications and project funding. STEM and digital humanities tend to be uh, better funded than traditional classics and philological approaches, um, for now anyway. And it also prepares students for multiple career fields. You can use digital 3D models in anything from uh, healthcare to, of course, archaeology, museum studies, um, but also in um, architecture, in all sorts of different kinds of work. Okay. Whom are 3D models for? The short answer is everyone. The long answer is uh, they are useful for students of all ages, uh, people who can't access collections due to distance, uh, especially in Canada and North America in general. Um, museums may be much further from students than in other places in the world. Um, due to money issues or disability, if you can't physically access a space, and especially if you're, say, a wheelchair user, who can't visually, um, who can't raise your eye to the level that is expected in many museums, uh, you're, you're left out of viewing these objects. Um, it's also great for homeschoolers. And in COVID times, even people who normally might have access to museum collections, including curatorial staff, do not. So this is a great way to be able to study these objects. They're also great for library groups, scouting groups. Um, the printed models are wonderful for blind people and for care homes. Uh, just general community outreach. 3D printed models are really good also because they can be printed all over the world using very basic software. Um, but for younger students and people with mobility issues like arthritis, they can be scaled up to, to be handled much more safely uh, so they don't prevent a choking hazard. Uh, and they are fairly indestructible for younger students in particular, that's really important. 
So some of the limitations of 3D models depend on the people doing the scans and what they know of the software involved. So as you can see on the slide here, there are two different versions of 3D models of King Tutankhamun's funeral golden mask. On, the, on your right um, is a mask that looks very similar to the real thing in real life. And on the left, you can see that the eyes are very elongated. The top of the Nemes headdress has been distorted. Um, there are some issues around the shoulders. Uh, and in general, the face is not as clear or as well done, including the mouth has the mouth has drastically reduced in size. And that's because of photographic distortions when you combine multiple images from different angles into a single image. So the person on the right is more skilled or has access to better software. Um, both images are free to download online and to manipulate. So when using uh, 3D models, it's important to think about uh, where your sources are and what kinds of things you want your students to draw from. Um, entry level skills are very easy. Almost anybody can do it if they have basic computer knowledge. Um, but once you want to up your game, there is a definite time commitment required to learn to better it. It's also very difficult to provide alternative text descriptions for unsighted or blind uh, users, especially for live models where you would be doing a walkthrough um, or turning around in 360 degrees to look at a space. Um, it's, it can be very complicated, if not impossible, given the limitations of modern software to provide fluid alt text descriptions. Um, it requires access to bandwidth and devices capable of streaming high quality images. Um, it's also limited to what we know of the archaeological record until we want to start experimenting. So many of the, of the digital 3D models are limited to building reconstructions or individual objects. Very rarely do you get whole composite pieces um, that are available for students to play with. Sometimes those are available as videos on YouTube um, to be watched but not manipulated themselves because they are such data heavy files. People who aren't digital wizards may require assistance to view and interact with digital models. And of course, the material for printing 3D ones can cost money. So. We know that many things that belong to poor people, which were often made of cheaper materials like papyrus, plant matter, or cheap clay, were extremely common in the ancient Mediterranean um, 3D models can give students a chance to play around with where they would have placed these and other objects within ancient spaces compared to the archaeological record, to textual references, to wall frescoes that demonstrate uh, home interiors, etc. So some of the things we can do with students are to ask them to design where they would have placed some of these objects. Um, once for utility and once for visual impact. You know, how, how does that differ in the way that you display these objects? Um, ask students which makes more sense to weigh in various contexts, in homes and temples. Um, if you're taking class and gender into account, where, uh, what kinds of materials are available to fill certain spaces, etc. In my own research, I'm doing this with objects from particular sites that contain both Roman and Egyptian material. These pieces are now separated by categories inside most museums, so they're not displayed together. But in first through third century CE Rome, they were. Um, I'm trying to recreate those spaces so that we get a better idea of how Romans thought about these kind of Egyptian materials and how they made them part of their own cultural identities. This is a discussion that you can be having with your students in your classroom, or if you're a student, with your professors in your classroom, um, using these 3D models to illustrate how these objects would have interacted and looked visually in a single space. Um, most ancient Mediterranean studies folks either don't have the time and resources to get started or don't know how easy it is to begin. Students in particular can take the lead here in approaching their professors and offering some of these options for alternative assignments. Also professors, you can um, offer these to your students if they don't know. You can use pre-built models and combine them to demonstrate examples of ancient spaces and the objects that filled them. You can alter SketchUp um, existing models um, 
of objects to reflect ancient polychromy to show off the brilliant colors and patterns that have long since disappeared from statues and buildings. You can analyze 3D models of objects to determine how they would have been placed based on whether parts of them were unfinished, like I described earlier. Um, you can use university resources to print 3D objects for use in campus museum displays and tours. You can use 3D models to enhance photographs of objects with more detail that you wouldn't get out of a single photograph to layer these photographs until you get better images, as you can see in the slide um, behind me. Then you can also use plans of ancient buildings to create digital models. I mean, you can get as creative as you want to. You can combine different models to create new spaces. You can um, use models that other people have created and add, you know, exterior design or wall frescoes or planting schemes. Whatever your focus is on, uh, you can change your 3D model approach so that students can have uh, the flexibility to do things other than simply write papers. It does require a great deal of research to do these well. So um, something like a 3D model with a bibliography attached, I think would make an excellent project. Um, okay, resources. So where can you start? It's a big world out there. YouTube has some great fly throughs if you want to start showing them to your classes right away, uh, just for demonstration purposes. Um, if you want to start things like downloading files. I've listed some options here. SketchUp.com is, uh, SketchUp in general is a wonderful 3D uh, resource. Cre you can create your own, or you can import models and manipulate them. Then you can export those models into software like MeshMaker, uh, which will convert it into a, a file that can be 3D printed. They also offer many free beginners text and video tutorials on YouTube and on their own website. SketchUp was purchased by Google, so you can uh, save everything to your Google account and share it through Google Slides very easily. Um, 3dwarehouse.sketchup.com and various other uh, 3D sites online offer many free and cheap uh, downloadable models that can be combined in interesting ways. Again, with the caveat that you should be wary of, um, of whether the person you're buying the model from has lots of experience, if they know what they had to do in the file code to, um, to make the pieces work together, if they note the flaws in their own research, uh, these are, or, or flaws in their own imagery, these are all things that you should be looking for before using specific images. Um, you can also get people to help you 3D print. Community college and university science and art departments, even if you're not at the university, often offer free or cheap resources for 3D printing um, using their own printers. And they are looking for ways to collaborate with other departments, especially within the university, to make the purchase of their own printers seem like a worthwhile expense in my experience. So it's a very good place to go. You can also 3D print at some museums, especially science museums, but also others. There are places known as maker spaces. These are community-based communal working spaces that offer tools and lessons on practical skills such as woodworking and wiring for free or cheap. And they often have 3D printers that are available if you bring your own file um, and pay a minimal fee for the materials. 3D printing companies themselves are often looking to donate to schools for the tax write-off or to test their own products on new kinds of imagery. So you can sometimes work with them to print small batches of materials if you want, you know, one lamp per student in your course or things like that. So there are, there are ways to get funding as well for digital humanities um, through, through classics associations across North America and Europe um, who are also looking to sponsor more initiatives in digital humanities if you want to be um, inventive in that way in your classroom. So the takeaway here is that in order for 3D models to work in a classroom, you have to take a flexible approach until you learn what works. Um, your students may also not be coming to this from a place where they have much experience. So starting with viewing 3D models together, talking about how you look through the, the model, 
analyzing them for faults and weaknesses and for positives, um, looking at what is missing in terms of texture, color, material, outdoor space, um, even angle that the light comes from. All of these things can change the way that a space is perceived and that the objects in it are perceived. So starting from viewing models and manipulating models and moving toward creating their own assemblages um, that can result in sort of digital exhibitions, uh, just giving students new ways to interact with objects so that they if they have no access to physical objects, or even if they do, and those physical objects cannot be moved or touched and they have to be studied from a distance, this is a really good way to get students um, involved and to give them access to these spaces and places. Uh, so yeah, have, flex have fun, be flexible, and learn together. Peter, that's it for me. Okay, thanks very much, Beth. Um, do you want to? Uh, oh, I was going to say, stop your screen sharing, and then we can uh, we can move to questions. So, thanks very much. That's a I, yeah, really inspiring kind of thing to hear at the beginning of term with these amazing ideas to think about what to do with our classrooms. So, I'm sure I'm not the only person in the audience who feels that way and is thinking about heading to the 3D warehouse or or find seeing if I don't know if our library has a 3D printer, but checking it out. Um, <laughs> Peter, my son just sold his 3D printer. Now I'm regretting it. <laughs> oh. I, I am. What a shame. Like, I know he just sold it. He goes, I don't have any use for it. I wish I'd heard this first. I would have, uh, hey, I could have donated it to the university. But anyway. For those in the audience who have questions, there's a, a question and answer button uh, or, or yeah, button at the middle of the screen at the bottom, I believe, where you can type in your questions and then I'll uh, I'll be able to, um, to ask uh, uh, about your questions. So. Uh, yeah, thank you to my colleague, Dr. Funky, for telling me we do have a 3D printer on campus. Okay. <laughs> so maybe while people are sort of uh, processing the talk and thinking of their own questions, and I'm monitoring someone who's coloring all over my floor, uh, I'll just ask that you mentioned a, a bit about, you know, using this in your own uh, research work. And so I just wonder if you could expand on how, you know, how you've incorporated models and maybe which types of models into your own uh, research. So what I'm doing is essentially I'm creating from the ground up replicas of four sites in Rome and Tivoli where Romans used high amounts of Egyptian or Egyptian inspired objects. So I'm putting them, I'm creating the physical space, the architectural space. I'm reproducing as best I can any floor mosaics, any wall decorations, um, any fabrics that we know about basically everything that we can about the space itself. And then I'm trying to put the objects, which are now displayed in separate places in museums, together based on traditional Roman wall art depictions of how Egyptian and non-Egyptian objects were displayed together and what we know about textual references for that. So when you do the fly through of my space, what you will get, for example, is a section of Hadrian's Villa at Tivoli uh, called the Antinuon, where you will come from the outside and you will see the obelisk outside and you will walk in and you will see the colorful uh, fake hieroglyphics on the walls. You will see tile mosaics on the floor and you will see statues of Antinuus in um, red marble and in white marble uh, displayed together with um, uh, Egyptian objects that he brought or bought um, in Rome from ancient Egypt, so uh, a kneeling statue of a pharaoh, etc., trying to put them all together as they would have looked, and then you can look around and get a better idea of how Romans would have perceived these objects in situ. And how will that, like, appear with your, you know, is this is your dissertation research? Like, how do you, how do you publish like that? I'm curious. Well, it's a bit complicated and involves probably lots of still shots, um, I imagine it will be a color publication, very much so. Um, but I also have to, you know, when I submit my dissertation, I have to include like a USB with my whole database and a bunch of software on it, et cetera. So that will be very interesting. Um, but I also am planning, I, I have access to resources here to print 3D models. And my D&D crew, um, I play Dungeons and Dragons and they paint models quite a lot, little figurines. And they're helping me to paint my models, which are being printed in gray, grayscale material. Um, so I can, I'm making the space and I'm making it with 
I haven't decided yet, depending on what the materials cost, either without a roof or with a removable roof. And then you can move the statues around. And those will go on display in an exhibition here in Florence. But because it's 3D printable files, once my thesis is published, I can send them to anyone at any school and they can mess around with them and have their students print them and do all of this sort of work on their own, comparing it to my still shots and seeing what they would like to do with it. Hopefully it will be a bunch of simultaneous exhibitions or non-simultaneous exhibitions. Um, I'd love to see what people do with it, so. That's amazing. I, as a personal note, I like the transferable skill of miniature D&D painting as well, uh, which I, <laughs> I like to go back in time and tell my parents was uh, was a thing. <laughs> right? Those little one hair paint brushes. Yeah, yeah. Was a use to, was, all that time was actually really useful. So that's it's good to know. Uh, we do have a couple of questions, so I don't want to talk too much. Um, from uh, my colleague here, uh, Melissa Funky, she asks if you have any thoughts on the best use of 3D models in the museum context. Well, for example, people who are either leading student tours or uh, tours for blind, for the blind people um, often find that it's really hard to get students to sit still for so long and describing literally every single exhibit to a blind person can be exhausting for both you and them. Um, there's a lot of nuance. Doing something with a 3D printer means that you can change the scale uh, of the relief. For example, if you have a um, a uh, Grecian vase that's uh, one of the orange and black vases, you can change the scale of the relief so um, you can bring out the, the orange and leave the black in the background. And when you 3D print it, it comes out at different levels. And that means that blind people, especially, but also children, can have a tactile experience of touching the paintings on the vase um, as they move through the museum and they can feel the difference uh, in weight and size. Um, in painting technique, etc. So that's that's much easier to keep, let's say, uh, teenagers or kids entertained because they can talk, not that they're going to toss them around, but if they drop it, it's not going to break. Um, and they can touch everything, they can look inside, they can lift lids off things. Um, and then especially for blind people or people who have, um, who are vision impaired, they can touch many more things and you can give them the, the experience of feeling an ancient signature that's painted onto a vase from the maker, et cetera. Right. Things that they can't get um, from a general easy, easy explanation that you would do. Yeah, that's great. And I, in context, I see with one of the, or someone commented in the chat, uh, Deborah saying, yeah, this is, this is, gives a lot to think about for accessibility as you highlighted. So that's another mm -hmm. element there. Um, let me just forget my Q&A again, sorry. Uh, yeah, so from uh, our friend, David McMaster, uh, I'd be, Okay, I'd be interested if you have <laughs> suggestions for some curated collections of some of these digital models. As an outsider to archaeology, I feel a little unsure of my ability to distinguish good from bad. Good from others, she says. I shouldn't put words in her mouth. So, um, if you go to, um, let's see, where did I put it? So, 3dwarehouse.sketchup.com you can see scans that are done from the National Museums of Scotland and the British Museum. They both have like very, very distinctive large collections and they put everything from mummy masks to um, ancient chess pieces, uh, medieval chess pieces and all of these other kinds of things. You can go onto their website and download them and print them. Um, it, they also have quite a lot of good examples for numismatics which in my experience, even in, especially in museum contexts, are so small, the originals are so small that you can't really see any of the detail if you're trying to teach someone how to read the abbreviations in Latin, or you're trying to show them uh, the importance of the difference between a sheaf of wheat, a sheaf of wheat and a lotus, uh, if they can't see that detail because it's rubbed off. So you can blow up the 3D models to bigger size for use in the classroom or in museum displays, et cetera. Um, but yes, that's the, that's a great one. So it's 3dwarehouse.sketchup.com. I will type it in the chat. Great, thank you very much. Um, we have another question. Let me just find it again. Oh yeah, from, uh, from our colleague at the University of Manitoba, Maureen Babb. In paleontology, 3D models are often created with the aid of CT scanners, which among other things, allow researchers to see interior space without destroying fossils. I imagine there would be some benefit to seeing the interior of archaeological objects. 
have you seen much of CT scanners in use for classics uh, and or for studies of the interior bits we can't see or easily see using 3D models? So I'm obsessed with various different kinds of scanning uh, and analysis. I have seen some things along those lines, but in my experience, um, because things have to be sort of mobile, either the scanner, which costs a lot of money, or the object has to be um, fairly mobile and not going to be damaged as you move it around, they tend not to CT scan things. There is one department um, that's working with the University of Oxford and the Egyptian Museum in Turin to do essentially um, neutron activation scanning. There are only two of these such scanners in the world and they cost millions of dollars. Um, so there are only a few objects scanned, but that's giving us actually a way to analyze um, certain perfumes that are in closed, still sealed Egyptian jars, which is really interesting. Um, for the most part, uh, in my experience, archaeology is not doing a lot of mobile CT scanning. I think it's a real shame because the, for me, the inside of a vase, for example, can tell you as much, um, if not more, about the construction as the outside. If you can see leftover coil marks, you can see smoothing marks, you can see uh, burning over usage, you can find thumbprints. I'd love for them to be, for there to be a 3D scan database of uh, ancient thumbprints of potters so we could compare, you know, who's doing what where. I think that would be really interesting. So there, there are options. Uh, we're just not taking advantage of them, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that does seem surprising to me. I mean, the cost aside, that you, yeah, it does seem like you would want that to see the interior of things is is obviously a uh, yeah kind of critical. So yeah, that's very interesting that, that it's it's I guess it's out there still to be done right by by people once that we get access they get access to this and that speaks to your your point at the beginning that this is interdisciplinary and has sort of applications to get classics out of you know a kind of philological zone or whatever and uh, and uh, and take it into other disciplines and outside of our subdisciplines. Well, the other thing is that you can scan nearly anything that you can see three corners of um, at the same time, as long as you, so there are many phone apps that you can do this on. Um, if you Google like free phone scanner apps, there are like top 10 lists and everything. Basically, you have to print a little target. You have to print three of them. You can print them on the same sheet of paper, and then you have to place them around the object um, because the target is set at a certain size. Your phone can recognize then the ratio, the proportion and size of the object itself based on viewing those three points. So you can scan all kinds of objects around your house, in your local museum, um, anything you want really. But to do the inside is almost impossible, especially of things like ceramics, because there's only one place really to put a target that doesn't block off all of the visuals. <laughs> There are other 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 questions uh, from our audience. I have more, but I don't want to uh, <laughs> <laughs> just take over. But maybe while people are still thinking, I'll just ask another one. You you mentioned about so museums uh, applications of this in museums in the university classroom, and I think you sort of touched on like the you know public school or elementary school classroom. I just wondered if you, have you sort of to like have you ever in, engaged that yourself, like sort of brought this kind of technology or these models to public schools or do you know people who have and how, how has it been successful would say, well, I mean, two-year-olds are on my mind right now, but let's say a little older than two. <laughs> well, um, in the museum in Florence here, I'm in Florence, Italy right now, in the archaeological museum, they have some reproduction ceramics for people to play with as they move through models. And they do something that's called a museum box where, um, I mean, various museums do this, where they put together facsimiles of things and send them to students. But usually it's ephemera. Um, I have yet to really see 3D models be utilized uh, in that way. So far, I don't really have the opportunity here to go into secondary school classrooms and high school classrooms um, to teach um, because I don't have the models printed yet. But I think adding it to something like a museum box or donating things to um, to libraries that do teaching group things like that, or to museums themselves who have curators who go out into the classroom, etc., or where teachers could check out a box um, would be really useful because I think a lot of teachers, especially at that grade level, 
also don't necessarily have the time and resources, but they're not strictly dedicated to classics or to Latin necessarily. They have a lot of things to cover. So I think this is a great situation where um, higher education folks can really reach out and make better connections with those people. Yeah, that's a great point. And as you alluded to, there's been a little bit of that during the pandemic, I think, with people homeschooling. And some people I know, a couple of my colleagues here have done that, but this is a way to kind of keep that going and make it just really part of um, what, what classics, ancient classicists, ancient historians, archaeologists do to kind of show relevance and also to reach those audiences. It also helps bring especially Latin students into a more holistic understanding of the Roman world that's not just this is what text tells us. Um, it can be really difficult to cover uh, the difference between archaeological evidence and textual evidence when you're focusing so much on text and philology and language learning. So this is a really great way to do something like, you know, showing uh, coin, like numismatic coin and metal inscriptions or what's written on a lamp or, you know, language that's written on a, on a funerary inscription, etc. Things that they can actually touch and see and, and bring to life. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Are there other questions uh, for Ben? I'll wait a moment. Maybe everyone is everyone is busy at 3dwarehouse.sketchup.com or, or working out what uh, what 3D models they can integrate into their into their classes. Um, yeah, I mean that that uh, last slide that I put up here, I'm going to copy the, the particular one into the chat. Um, this is a particularly good YouTube fly through. That is, uh, it covers Pompeii. And it goes from an upper class family into servants' quarters and like walks them past graffiti and some shops and into a poorer area of town. So you can see how the city would have interacted with different groups living together in the same areas. Um, and you're not just seeing this is a rich person's house covered in marble. So yeah, I really like that one as a starter. And it's about five minutes long to walk through. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, um, we can also um, no, oh, I'll say that we're, we're recording the talk. So um, if people also want to revisit the PowerPoint and some of the resources you mentioned, that they can find it on our YouTube channel. Uh, it usually takes me a couple of days to get it up, so sometime early next week. But uh, maybe before I, I thank uh, Bet, I'll just mention to those uh, watching, we do have a, a series of talks coming up this fall on Zoom. So our next talk is October 22nd. I believe the title is Crafting an Image of Sincerity, Autobiography Through Letter uh, by Professor Chris Lafitte of the University of Toronto. We have further talks on November 5th and November 12th, uh, one of which is on Hercules and Greek religion, and the other by my colleague here, Melissa Funky, as well, on uh, uses of uh, classical sculpture in the Manitoba legislature building, so uh, about sort of reception. <laughs> So with that, I apologize for the noise in the background. Um, I'd really like to thank Bet for launching our fifth series here with such an innovative talk, an interesting one, for coming to us from uh, late, late at night in Italy as well. So thank you very much for joining us and for putting up with the noise in the background. So I'll uh, just say thank you very much to you and thanks to audience members who've attended today. We very much appreciate it and hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bethany.